Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to those who are listening to us from the East. Welcome to this, our third webinar in the Caribbean Africa Trade Webinar Series. And it's really just such a pleasure for us to welcome to you to this webinar. Um, you know, we've had two already really, really good ones, and we're looking forward to this session. Today, we'll be dealing with the more traditional aspects of trade. Uh, for, you know, trade in goods, trade in services, and intellectual property. So things that we're already sort of uh, more familiar with uh, versus last week, we were dealing with the newer generation issues. But as we discussed last week, that these are probably going to be part of the, you know, the rubric of trade going forward. And so, of course, we're going to be dealing with these in the regional integration aspects uh, of the Caribbean and African region. So we really look forward to hearing our experts, uh, Gladys Young of CARICOM, Secretariat and Sotetsi Makong of Chapka, walking us through these disciplines. So I just want to highlight a few things that we will hear today, obviously, but I think we should always keep in the back of our mind is as much as our two regions are very different, we share a lot and there's a lot of similarities. And some of the things we will hear is that, you know, there's small market sizes, low competitiveness, you know, low manufacturing capabilities, infrastructural challenges. It's, it's really difficult to travel within between the countries. It's even easier to, to trade with countries that are outside the region um, than internally. And of course, the reason for the regional integration is this low interregional trade, which this in, the integration project seeks to, to address. And of course, all of this comes, you know, more or less from the history and the legacy of colonialism whereby both regions have been trading more with the EU countries and of course, CARICOM with the US as well than with each other. The projects are meant to change these difficulties and these challenges, but there have been problems obviously in the CARICOM side. And I mean, the African Regional Integration Project is not new. The AFCFT is not the new thing. It's been, it started back in the 1960s uh, when the Pan-African Founding Fathers started the Pan-African Project. And so obviously there's clear differences, of course, as well. One of them obviously being market size. I mean, we're talking about 1.2 billion people in Africa versus 45 million in the Caribbean. And obviously the goods traded are different. And also you'll see the difference in regime. And I think I would say that the CARICOM region has gone a little bit further than Africa in freedom of movement of people, <laughs> which is something that uh, Africa is really struggling with. So I hope that we will hear some of these and of course more. And please do not hesitate to ask our experts any question regarding their presentations. And before we get started and Janive takes over and introduces herself, I would like to thank our partners who have walked with us this journey so far and will continue with us until the end of the series. Yui, the Sridhar Shrampal Center, Afronomics Law, Trellick and Trapka. So I'm turning over to you, Janive. Excellent, and thank you so much, Kolo, uh, my co-facilitator, my sister over um, from the African continent. I, I have the distinct pleasure this morning of um, being um, able to welcome two new experts to our series. Um, in the like fashion of the previous webinars, we will have one speaker who will speak on the CARICOM integration uh, movement and in this case uh, good services and if she has time the IP regime under that um, uh, integration uh, scheme and on the other hand we have uh, a gentleman hailing from Africa who will talk uh, also about the uh, integration systems because there, there are many um, in the African context uh, looking primarily at the AFCF we hope to conclude this webinar within the allotted time of an hour. We would encourage the audience members who we welcome to post any questions they have as it, as it occurs to them in the Q&A function and it will allow the speakers to cogitate on the questions and maybe even uh, reflect them in the remarks that they are making. But we are going to really try to hold fast to our commitment to allow you to ask your questions. Uh, and have them answered so that we have 15 to 20 minutes at the tail end to address the questions and the speakers will try to keep their presentations um, within the time limit of 15, no longer than 20 minutes. So let me start with introducing the, our CARICOM secretariat expert. 
Um, let me introduce Mrs. Gladys Young. She's an attorney at law with expertise in international law and regional integration. And she's the senior legal officer at the Caribbean Community Secretariat responsible for matters falling under what we call the Caribbean single market and economy. And she will explain that in more detail. She provides advice on the implementation of the CSME, interpretation of the treaty that sets up the CSME and non-compliance issues. She assists with drafting of treaties and other arrangements and has actually represented the community before our indigenous Caribbean Court of Justice. Um, Ms. Young has a history of working with the government of Jamaica prior to her stint at CARICOM. She's a Commonwealth scholar. She has a Master's of Law in International Economic Law from the University College London, a JD from Georgetown University Law Center, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Long Island University. So welcome, welcome, Ms. Young. We look forward to your remarks. But before I turn to you, let me introduce Mr. Sosetsi Makong, affectionately called by everyone Makong. <laughs> We've gotten permission to continue with that uh, tradition. Uh, Mr. Makong holds an MSc in International Trade Policy and Trade Law, an LLM in Intellectual Property and Technology Law, as well as another LLM in Computer and Communications Law, the Universities of Liverpool, Queen Mary of London, um, he also holds a graduate certificate in trade finance from Middlesex uh, University. He currently, I should have started with that, is a trade facilitation expert at TRAPCA, which is the trade policy training center in Africa based out of, the, I believe it's Tanzania, right, Makong? Um, he previously was a counselor at the Lesotho Mission in Geneva, and chair of the WTO committees on trade related investment measures and import licensing, a chief negotiator of the G77 and China Geneva chapter. And you know, his uh, capacities and capabilities also extend. Um, so I have two experts who I am really, really pleased to welcome. And without further ado, we're gonna start with Ms. Young from the CARICOM Secretariat, uh, who will speak on the good services and IP regime under that regional integration system. So over to you, Gladys. Thank you, Jan and Kolo, and thanks to the organizers for a very excellent um, webinar series. I'm happy to be participating in it. And I don't need to go into the background in terms of the purpose for the community because Kolo has done an excellent job in actually setting out that framework of um, the why, why we would have um, done any sort of integration. I'm going to focus on the Caribbean community recognizing that there are other trading arrangements in, in the region, um, but focusing squarely on the Caribbean community um, and the services and goods aspects of, of CARICOM. The other part that I would want to just make um, from the get-go is it's true that we have done a lot of, a, a lot of work and that CARICOM um, the community is, is much broader than just even the trading goods and services, but that we go further into deeper cooperation in relation to um, things like disaster, uh, disaster management and emergency, the disaster planning and emergency management as we would have had the recent hurricane and the volcano. Um, and we have our institutions that are set up specifically to deal with some of those issues with health, um, with with education and we have deeper, closer cooperation and, and coordination known as one of the pillars called functional cooperation um, in the community of human and social development. Um, the, the next thing I'd want to just say is in relation to the skills, well, in relation to the single market and economy, while we have 15 member states of CARICOM, not all of them are participating in the CARICOM single market and economy, namely the Bahamas, um, and I think Junior would have spoken to that in one of the earlier webinars, is not participating in the CARICOM single market and economy. So when we speak of the regimes in relation to services and goods, um, this would not include the Bahamas. The Bahamas would participate um, only in relation to the CARIFORUM EU uh, construct in, in the 
um, economic partnership agreement. So those were just two things that I wanted to, to, to make clear. And in terms of Montserrat's participation, while it does participate in the CARICOM single market and economy, uh, Montserrat being an overseas territory um, of, of the UK, there are certain areas that it would not have authority to address on its own, such as um, transportation, air transport, and maritime transport, um, and matters of that in that regard. So moving forward, just to indicate that the, the single market and economy is comprised of the, the integral regime, such as the goods and services, um, and it is also buttressed by that sort of enabling environment that we have in relation to the macroeconomic convergence that is needed, the development of the community investment framework, um, the harmonized system for investments, the development of an integrated capital market addressing issues in relation to other aspects or access to finance and matters related to double taxation. And those are areas that are being worked on and are being advanced. But because of the nature of, of that area, it is, it is, a, it is a slower, slower move than what has happened in relation to the single market. And also you have that aspect in the revised treaty in relation to competition policy and consumer protection framework. Um, the development as Cola would have been alluded to in terms of transportation, the fact that CARICOM for the most part, other than Suriname and Guyana bordering each other, you have the island states and then you have um, Belize in Central America. So that the connections in terms of um, shipping, shipping and air, air transport are challenging in the in the region and then you have the harmonized policies that are being addressed in relation to agriculture industry um, tourism energy among others which again assist in the in the market but i wanted to focus again on the the services um, or, or movement of caricom nationals in in the services arrangement as well as the movement of goods and the work that we have been doing in that regard. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if, I, if, if, if others had said it, but just to also um, highlight, we, we have indicated that there are, uh, there is a separate sub-regional grouping in CARICOM, the Organization of Eastern, Car um, Car Eastern Caribbean States which is a smaller subgrouping that has advanced further. I won't get into the details of their arrangements in this. Um, and also to indicate that within the CARICOM framework, and you will see it in chapter seven of the revised treaty mainly, um, you have what we, with a special and differential arrangement within the already gr the, the grouping of developing countries. But there is a recognition that there are some that are still um, more vulnerable or have greater challenges um, and that need a greater assistance in, in the regime. So in terms of the movement of CARICOM nationals, you'll find those provisions in chapter three of the revised treaty. And it is important um, to bear in mind the definition of CARICOM national, um, which would speak to citizens of member states. Um, we recently had a an amendment to make it clear that there a provision that spoke to um, Belonga was focused on Montserrat and did not apply to any other CARICOM country so that a citizen of member state um, and persons that are the British overseas territory citizen um, that has a status with Montserrat and that was a recent amendment done at the conference of heads of government meeting on Monday and Tuesday of this week. Um, it was adopted and, and was signed by at least two countries. Now, the other part of the definition of CARICOM national that is important, and especially for business and for investment opportunities when, when, when we're looking at investment linkages between Africa and the Caribbean, is in relation to the development of, uh, in, in relation to the definition of CARICOM national as, a, as it relates to a company, because a company has to be substantially owned and effectively controlled by CARICOM nationals, the natural persons, so citizens of the member states, or in the case of Montserrat, um, the British Overseas Territory citizen. 
Um, and that's important to bear in mind in terms of the 50%, and that has created challenges in terms of how we go forward in looking at issues relating to investment and investment opportunity, and further in, in terms of our external trade linkages. Um, the, the, in relation to movement of CARICOM nationals, it is car it's carried out under three broad areas, one in relation to the right of establishment, which is dealt with under Articles 32 to 34 of the Revised Treaty, which basically called for the removal of restrictions on the right of establishment and, and, and ensuring that you don't put any additional restrictions on the right of establishment. And the program for removal of restrictions was developed and, and all of those timelines have passed. So there are not supposed to be any restrictions on the right of establishment, save and except for um, the, the fact that there are areas that governments can exclude for in terms of the exercise of governmental authority. And that would apply to all, all aspects of movement of CARICOM nationals. You also have the temporary movement of CARICOM nationals to provide services, in really, and that's on the Article 36 of the Revised Treaty. But, and you additionally have um, those persons who would want to consume services, so persons who may want to come to um, Barbados or to Trinidad and Tobago in relation to medical services or to get um, services in terms of, um, well, healthcare, tourism, um, and other types of services, then you will have that sort of consumption of services. And so when there were, we've had cases before the Caribbean Court of Justice that have de dealt with what we call facilitation of travel, but persons have not made the link that facilitation of travel generally for CARICOM nationals is also that those CARICOM nationals are moving to consume services, um, albeit on a temporary basis. And then uh, finally, you also have what the heads have agreed and in terms of the provision of services and right of establishment, we, we refer to that as the non-wage earners, but then you have those who are the wage earners, those persons who are able to seek employment in a non-caricom country and they are the skilled, um, what we call categories of skilled community nationals. The treaty speaks to five, um, but that has now been expanded to 12 categories by the conference. So in addition to the university graduates, uh, musicians, artists, media workers, and sports persons, we now have um, holders of associate degrees, nurses and teachers that are not university graduates, artisans with a Car Caribbean vocational qualification, household domestics with a Caribbean vocational qualification or equivalent, um, security guards and agricultural workers and the security guards and agricultural workers were finalizing issues in terms of definitions and qualifications. Um, but as you can imagine, the decisions are taken and then you have to sort of work out what the administrative arrangements are, what the qualifications are. Um, and you have, the decision was very clear, you know, for example, artisans is with a Caribbean vocational qualification, but then sometimes you have challenges with member states then indicating that it has to be a particular level of Caribbean vocational qualification. And that's not part of the decision. So we have to go through and make it clear that it's any Caribbean vocational qualification level one to level five, the employer would determine what, what qualification is needed for the particular task. Sorry, Gladys, I think you turned off your mic by mistake. <laughs> by mistake, sorry about that. I touched all sorts of things. Uh, but in relation, thank you, thank you, Jan. Um, in relation to the, the movement of service providers as well, um, and the, the challenges that we're having. So we have already set up what, what the requirements are in terms of right of entry, the right of stay, so you have for um, persons establishing a business for skilled nationals moving to um, seek employment, they have a definite stay. In addition to the definite stay of six months, they have the opportunity to get indefinite stay in a member state. Persons temporarily providing a service would get the time period that they require to provide that service. 
and all CARICOM nationals have a right to, um, to travel and to enter a member state and to, to remain there for a period of six months. That said, our general exceptions would require that uh, member states do have a right in terms of persons who are undesirable because they are a genuine, present, and sufficiently serious threat to the, the um, security of a country and public safety of a country to refuse those persons' entry, as well as persons who would become a charge on the public funds. And that was set out very clearly in Shanique Mairi against the government of Barbados in terms of what those requirements are. Um, Jan, I'm sure when you're dealing with the, with the CCJ matters, you would indicate um, the developments that have happened. But um, just, to, just to highlight that, the court has given us a lot of guidance in terms of developing our procedures so that coming out of that case, we then develop procedures on refusal of entry. Um, coming out of, of, of cases in relation to goods, we've developed further procedures in relation to our common external tariff, with which I'll get to. But just to highlight some of that and, and highlight the fact that coming out of the um, Maurice Tomlinson case, we were able to, to highlight to member states that a skilled national, the treaty gives a skilled national the right. It's not the, the certificate that we, 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 in terms of the administrative procedures that we've put in place, that give the skilled national the right. And therefore, we have to ensure that whatever procedures we're putting in place in terms of the administrative measures are simple and are and facilitate the movement of CARICOM nationals. And that goes for skills, services, establishment. Um, to highlight in terms of services and establishment, we do have some challenges. We are finding that although member states were to remove restrictions, some restrictions still exist in terms of residency requirements, that there are some challenges in terms of qualification, recognition, um, accreditation, vocational qualifications differences in licensing and registration arrangements. And those are matters that we are continually working on. And we have um, developed, my colleagues would have developed the, in terms of the services sector, um, a services strategy that would um, take it forward in terms of how we are going to address those matters. In relation to companies, we are also working on things like the harmonization of business names registration, the harmonization of trademarks registration, which IP related, but it also relates to companies because a lot of times the business name and the trademark um, would go hand in hand. And also the, the uh, mutual recognition of, of companies and other and harmonization of other, of, of other measures in relation to companies. And most importantly, simplification and, um, and harmonization of of the administrative regimes generally. Um, in terms of, I will just, I, I, I won't have time to go through all of that, so I want to turn to goods um, to, to indicate that in relation to goods, I'd want to focus on two main issues, and that would be the common external tariff and the rules of community origin. Um, and that would be where a lot of the issues would be highlighted in any event. Um, in terms of the common external tariff, we have a common external tariff that in many, many, many of, much of the literature would say is more uncommon than it is common. But the common external tariff includes in it various lists so that it, it's established under Article 82 and it is actually now published on our Caribbean community website. So you can just type in carry com common external tariff and you can find it um, and you can download it and then go through and you'll be able to see the various lists that I'm talking about. But you have various lists. So while we have a common external tariff, there are departures allowed from the common external tariff by these lists. So we have list A, which allows for departures in terms of what the common external tariff might be, for example, 40% and it allows member states to apply a lower rate. Um, you also have the list C that has a minimum rate in terms of products that have a very low CET rate, but allows member states to apply a higher rate. And a lot of times those would be in relation to um, matters that government revenue, so example, uh, motor vehicles or, or, or things to that effect. 
Now, that being said, um, we are, you, and you also have what is called the conditional duty exemptions regime. So while the treaty in Article 83, um, as amended by the protocol to amend Article 83, sets out the grounds upon which quoted can authorize a suspension of the common external tariff or the grounds upon which quoted can alter the common external tariff. There are, the, the, the tariff is set up in such a way that you have conditional duty exemptions, which means that member states at the national level, based on what is set out in the rules of conditional duty exemptions can exempt um, from duty without seeking quoted authorization. Um, and obviously it has to go within the, the, the framework. Um, and within that conditional duty exemption, you do have products that are not eligible, such as brown sugar and flour. And I see my time coming up. So um, the rules of origin, I, I, won't, I, I will just say two things in relation to them. Um, look at Article 84 very clearly, um, Article 84 and Schedule 1 of the revised treaty in relation to rules of origin. Um, and what I would want to say is we are now in the process of reviewing both the common external tariff and the community rules of origin and looking at issues in, uh, we, have, we have the study out already and member states are consulting on it. And it is important for those persons that are certainly business oriented on this to also be liaising with their member states in relation to the rules of origin, because that is so, uh, in relation to the review, both the CET review and the, um, the rules of origin review. There are areas such as how we make our rules of origin more useful for the CARICOM framework, bearing in mind that CARICOM uh, we may not have a lot. We don't, we don't, that is where we have very various differences with Africa. Yes, we may have primary products, but a much smaller scale um, and, and not necessarily that would be that we would be able to have such protective rules of origin. So looking at issues such as accumulation being brought into the rules of origin regime, allowing for, um, allowing it to take in, um, account inputs from products traded under our other trade, free trade arrangements. Um, th that's one of the main issues that I would say, and in relation to the CET reform of the lists that we have um, and how we deal with particular products of special consideration. Um, I, my time is up, so I would want to end really by indicating a couple of things in relation to where we are going and where we, where, well, where it's important that we go um, in terms of, I've, I've already spoken to the fact that we are, before you would not have been able to find the, Caribbean, um, the common external tariff online. Um, you would not have been able to find, we have our CARICOM implementation plan also online that shows where member states are at. Um, and so it's important that we continue to build on that in terms of transparency, in terms of publication of decisions. We do have some decisions published um, and we need to continue to build on that and publish the decisions and publish them in a timely manner and make them such that you can search for them in terms of a keyword so that you'll be able to get all of the decisions. Um, it's challenging even for persons who are like me at working in that, I had to put together that um, something in relation to skills and just to find all of the decisions and put them together was, you know, a task. So I would say that is one. Um, two, that we need to be much more dy dynamic and responsive to the various changes that are happening around us and ensuring that we have our treaty framework in such a way that we continue to have this rules-based framework um, with the CCJ um, addressing the, the interpretation and application, but also ensure that we can make the amendments necessary or, or develop the protocols necessary in a quick and timely manner that is going to address the needs of of our member states and our community nationals and, and those that are investing in the region. And so you'll find that some of the things like our financial services agreement has taken a very long time and is still being um, negotiated. Um, areas such as developing, being able to do enhanced cooperation also 
has taken a long time and still being negotiated. And we need to ensure that when we do deal with the rules, I'm coming off now, Jan, uh, Jan when we do address the rules, that we, that we um, the rules of origin, for example, that we move some of those things out of the treaty or at least make for the amendment of those to be faster because the COTEN has the, the council, the council responsible has the duty to be continuously reviewing that, which means that it needs to be dynamic in terms of how, how we are able to amend them. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Gladys. I, I am sympathetic that you managed in 15, 20, 25 minutes to condense a huge amount of content in a way that was clear, bite-sized, but also did not omit um, sort of the nuances and, and, and the complexity of the issues that we face. So excellent, excellent. I actually, I know you were really involved in the last set of meetings, which actually concluded this Tuesday, our heads of government's meeting. And I would say that they should put you as some kind of press um, conference manager to kind of take the, the decisions and have a press conference after each of them to explain the decisions that have been made by the head so that it, it's, it's as clear, bite-sized uh, and digestible as what you just did. So I'm really anxious for questions because I see there are already two um, in the Q&A function and I encourage others to write more. But before we run out of time, I'm now going to quickly pass the floor to uh, Macon, who's going to talk about the African experience. So over to you, Macon. Thank you very much, Jane. And also, let me extend my thanks uh, to Kolo for having put this uh, together. Uh, I think this is a great initiative. Um, really, I think every single one of them I hope to attend and I've uh, been able to follow through the first that ran. Now, I, I just want to really put my statements at the high level. I will not go into specifics. I mean, Africa is vast. It's, it's a huge continent. and um, But let me first of all make this statement that we know, and I know that uh, all of us here in this uh, platform, we are lawyers. And th the fact of the matter is that international economic law, at least from my own perspective, it seeks to bring to life economic theory. So under economic theory, there are certain assumptions that if you have a certain economic regime, it will yield certain results. So we have all these assumptions, whether you talk about trading goods, you talk about uh, trading services, IP, all the way up to competition policy and all of these uh, different uh, regimes we have. So these are the assumptions. And I think the biggest question is whether the regimes that we have are yielding the outcomes as per the assumptions. And I think we've been in this game for a couple of years. Uh, you start with the WTO and then, you, I mean, some of us in the Southern part of Africa, we started with SACU and all of that. And then you ask yourself, are the regimes really yielding all these expected assumptions that we find in economic theory? And I think that's an area where we, as developing countries and LDCs, we need to make sure that we square that cycle. Hopefully it is squareable. Um, now, the, having said that, in the continent of Africa, we have multiple regimes, a number of wrecks with uh, multiple rules in the same areas. Um, if you look at, for example, our customs union, you have, for example, SACU in the southern part of Africa, you have East African community, you also have another customs union in the western part of Africa, even for the regional economic communities that do not yet have wrecks they also have their own ambitions to create customs in on and move up the ladder again of these economic um, assumptions where you would have the common market and what have you all the way up to political federation. Now think about it. Each and every one of these regimes, they have this uh, idea and an objective to individually go up to all these different ladders. And now there is no connecting factor amongst them, except for, of course, one uh, treaty we have in the continent, uh, namely Abuja Treaty. But again, you are all uh, students uh, of, of international law. You know that these agreements, they are individually distinct and separate and independent one from the other. And the, the issue is again about squaring the cycle. How are we going to square this particular cycle? And I believe we need to be very careful. That is Africa has to be careful that 
it doesn't undergo a, a, what I normally say to my students, uh, it doesn't go through a process of disintegration through integration, whereby you have so many multiple regimes and in the final analysis, it becomes oh, oh, obviously difficult to actually reconcile the regimes. So that's how I wanted to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, preface my, my comments and really say that uh, it is important therefore for us in the continent to begin to be thinking about this. I mean, we've been talking about spaghetti bowl and it is happening in the continent, countries you know, belonging to multiple regimes. And again, the issue also for me, even today I was running a program for one government I won't mention. And uh, one of the things that we discussed, the this particular country is in multiple regimes. And I, the question that I asked is to say, tell me, if you take a particular commitment, let's say that you made under the EAC regime or under another re regional economic community we have called SADAC in the same area, but it's conflicting. How do you then domesticate it? How did you pass these particular treaties through the same parliament? Because all of these have been ratified. How, how then do you just domesticate rules that are actually in conflict? And this is a problem that I think the more we add onto these layers without really having to do the you know your checks and balances we actually are running into a very problematic area whereby uh, it may be a little bit more impervious really in, in the sense that we would not be able to pull through and push through and achieve these um ideals that and assumptions that we get from the economic theory so i thought that i should maybe throw in this uh, a nuclear bomb before i can um I touch on a on a couple of things that i think are very important and, and therefore, I, I believe that as we have this conversation, we really have to somehow get to depoliticize economic integration and make sure that we have a, an honest conversation that is uh, more disinterested. Let's put the interest aside and just focus on, on, on the issues. Let me speak to the issue of the goods and services, and I'll, I'll cluster this uh, into, into one. And, and, and Jen, if I, I go beyond the time, please do stop me. Um, the, 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 the goods and services, and I, I've been a negotiator before, and, and uh, I've, I was honored for a couple of years to be the chief negotiator of the Africa Group under the WTO framework. How do we negotiate these regimes? The fact of the matter is that we separate goods from services. So we, even within trading goods, the regimes are such that we will negotiate the tariff concessions when we are done, we'll go and then negotiate rules of origin, right? Then we'll go into uh, the sensitive, uh, you know, exclusion list and what have you. Within that particular chapter itself, we separate all of this within goods itself, uh, the, the goods chapter itself. If you go into services as well, we replicate the same thing. But I think um, the little lesson that I learned uh, when I was uh, a negotiator in Geneva, is like observing how the big boys are doing it. And I found that actually, it's, it's, it's a, there's a threat that cuts through all these different chapters. And I was saying even today to the, uh, the, 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 the participants I had in, in my training to say, when you, you begin to negotiate, are you putting in place theoretical rules or you are basically putting in place a regime that will mirror or that will resemble the features of your market? Or you are basically taking a regime because somebody told you that these rules will work for you. So let me take these rules and see. Hopefully God will come and help me. And then somehow these benefits that have been, uh, you know, let's say foreseen by this, um, the economic theory will somehow rain from the sky and somehow things will, will be well. And but this is the question that I asked. And, and I think we, we have to be very conscious because I believe when we read, for example, how GATT came about and when you read all those old documents as to who proposed what during the inception phase of GATT all the way up to the WTO, we know that those rules, according to, let's say, the countries that made those proposals, those rules, they modeled the business models of, country, of companies in those countries. So you basically create rules so that you ensure that your companies have market access. And that, I mean, that is the essence as to why such, such, you know, these rules were created. Now, my fear is that we find ourselves chasing after shadows in the sense that we chase the theory and probably to a certain degree, we forget that we need to create the rules that reflect the market dynamics in our countries. The last example I'll make on this uh, sort of a uh, uh, rant on uh, <laughs> the, the, the goods and, and services uh, part is that 
When I have a, a businessman in, uh, let's say, Lesotho, my own country where I come from, and they want to export goods probably, let's say, to Tanzania, where I'm working right now. I'm sure that businessman doesn't make a distinction between what you call trading goods rules, what you, know, you call trading services rules. They would want to know what sort of clearances do I need in terms of the permits, in terms of my car, the driver, you know, the goods, in terms of the standards. For them, they look at this thing as one and the same thing. So they, the business people look at trade from a transactional point of view. I'm not suggesting that we need to come up with transactional regimes, but what I'm saying is that we cannot afford to de-link goods and services because in the eyes of uh, business people, there isn't that distinction. It is the bureaucrats who come up with those uh, you know, fictitious uh, distinctions. So I, I think that we have to ensure that there are interlinkages between the various sectors of the economy that we liberalize, and of course, look at the rules at the horizontal level. So they should cover everything across the board. And I believe this is an important uh, area. And of course, our regimes so far, we have not yet been able to achieve that. If you ask me, uh, for example, if you take the East African community and you look at the degree to which countries have opened up the, the markets uh, to each other, I mean, the level of trade is around 15%. And these countries are trading more, like, like you said, Jen, with Europe and other, you know, with China. And yet, actually, we are in the same neighborhood, but we can't even be able to exchange goods amongst ourselves. So, uh, again, this is an important part. And I want to also mention a statistic that um, today Africa imports about 60% of its food food bill uh, is, is important you know uh, uh, you know let's say consumables from europe uh, mostly and partly from china 60 percent we have arable land um if you look at uh, the, the statistics about 60 percent of the global ar arable land is is in africa yet we import 60 percent of our food from outside i believe that if i'm a sensible businessman i would say that there is an opportunity to invest in these very same you know, lines where we import, let's say if it's yogurt, if it's, it, is, it is cheese from Europe, what have you, how come that we are failing to ensure that the regime is able to bring investment into Africa because we would have opened up the market for ourselves. So we, we have these conundrums and I think as far as I'm concerned, trade law, econo international economic law, it has to be practical, shouldn't be uh, you know, an academic exercise. So there are things that I believe would we, we, we need to do as the continent and begin to go dig down the data and look at those trends uh, in terms of import and exports and build rules around some of these and make sure that our, 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 um, our regions thrive and, and they grow. By the way, like I said, you can, you know, you have to make sure that the rules in terms of services and goods, they work like a hand in a glove. At the same time, what I'm also saying is that it is possible in my mind, at least theoretically speaking, that you can also draw investment to come into Africa by simply looking at those uh, trade flows from, you know, out of the continent and from out of the continent. So these are some of the things that I think are quite uh, important. Now I'd like to also speak to another point. Um, and this has to do with the market structure, and I, I would like you to, uh, you know, like us to, to think about it um, in, 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 a, in, in a much more practical sense. We have rules, and uh, whether it be trading rules, trading services, think about, um, let's say, uh, rules of origin, the requirements that need to be met by uh, our businesses. In Africa, on average, in any given country that you'll find, we know that the share of market players, let's say looking at the small and medium enterprises and the uh, micro and small medium enterprises relative to the, um, the multinational companies, it's about 95% to five. In some countries, it can even go up to you know 98% being SMEs and 2% uh, being multinational companies. And I always have to make it clear that I, I'm not against multinational companies. I think they are good in terms of, you know, transferring the technology and all the good things that come with having these big companies in our, in, in our jurisdictions. What I'm saying, therefore, is let's pause for a moment and ask ourselves, which small and medium enterprise will be able to meet the uh, uh, rules of origin that we have in our, in our goods chapter? Let's name one, right? And I think in, in so thinking, we are, we are thinking of, uh, you know, international economic law in a practical way. The question is, if our small and medium enterprises cannot meet the rules that we, 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 we set out, what are we saying about the rules that we have? 
it, it's a big question mark. And when you look at our trade regimes in the continent, the beauty of it, I think, which is really, I think, a good thing, in the EAC, they have started to talk about how can we enhance trade in terms of the small and medium enterprises to foster cross-border trade. There, there are some initiatives in there, and then there are initiatives as well at the commercial level, another, um, you know, uh, every regional economic community we have in the, in the, in the continent. But you see, the, the challenge that we are having, we have not yet uh, you know, created a regime, a, a legal regime, an economic legal regime that will ensure that these 90 plus, uh, 95 plus uh, players in our markets are able to benefit from regional integration. And I think we really need to take a microscope, a very big one, and look closely into this issue because these are the guys who pay our salaries because uh, you know, I mean, these, you know that uh, the, the, the taxes are collected mostly from these small and medium enterprises. So they actually, they are, the, the economy is basically on the shoulders of these guys. But the rules we create are a little bit far away from meeting probably their legitimate expectations. So I think it's an issue that we need to think about. How do we appropriate the rules in the context of situating them within the different market structures that we have? If we are talking about having, um, you know, you know cross-continental trade, I believe it is the same small and medium enterprises who can even foster this particular trade, whether it be in the area of services. Um, you know, you know. I mean, we two minutes. Okay, I'm about to finish. Let me just uh, go to IP and then conclude and say that. Um, under the AFC FTA, we are also having negotiations that have been primed to cover uh, IP and there will be an IP protocol on that. And I think, uh, think about it this way that we have least developed countries that are members of the WTO and these countries have flexibilities under the WTO. I can tell you as of today, again, this is something that I was covering with my participants, uh, you know, in this particular X country that is unknown. Um, we, we looked at the fact that already the, the LDCs in Africa have compromised the flexibilities that they've gotten under the WTO framework because we also have regional, uh, in, you know, uh, regimes on IP where they basically, you know, let's say prevent these countries from doing exactly what the flexibilities have granted for them to do. So we, we have a problem and a challenge in this particular case, and we can expound further on this issue uh, as to how countries themselves are undermining the flexibilities that they, they have been granted and therefore are even unable to make use of those flexibilities. Now it's the same countries, right, who are members of the WTO and they're also the members of these regional economic uh, communities and, and other IP regimes. But I also lastly just to speak to the fact that I think we have also an opportunity and I had an opportunity to be involved in the WIPO negotiations uh, on um, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, genetic resources and folklore when I was in Geneva. And I believe that if ever there is an opportunity that Africa has, and I believe the Caribbean will, it's the same thing. Why should we wait for the big countries to create international law? Because we can create our own rules and set new standards in the area of traditional knowledge, genetic resources, and, and folklore. And I, I can tell you a lot of stories about this particular particular areas. And I believe we, we do have to think through and hard about it. And as developing countries, I hope we can be able to meet up and uh, at some point and, and, and make sure that we, we look into areas that can basically uh, foster uh, and make sure that we, we basically um, benefit from our comparative advantages. I think I wanted to say something on the movement of, of, of persons, but I, I think uh, uh, Clarice uh, very well uh, you know, spoke to that area. So I think we are in the same direction you know, to an appreciable degree, but otherwise, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you. Akong, if you wanted to say, because services is such a huge, the important part. If you wanted to have one minute, because I think Gladys has done us the favor of answering all the written questions. If you wanted to just very quickly um, just give an overview and then your nuclear bomb presentation deserves some kind of response. Uh, so so I'd, I'd give you that opportunity to do one, one minute, if you can, one to two minutes of the services regime. No, thank, thanks a lot. And I think uh, the, the beauty of what we're having in Africa is that some regions like the ECOWAS, they've been able, that is another regional economic community for those of you who are not uh, um, familiar with our, our organizations, this side, this part of the world. Um, I think they've, they, they are, they're doing a good, a good work. And I mean, if you go 
to any uh, airport in, in, in Africa, you'll find someone with the ECOWAS passport. And, and I think, again, we have an initiative at the continental level, at the level of the African Union that is moving towards the same direction where we'll have even one African Union passport. Of course, this is, these are things that are still at an earlier, early stage. Now, be that as it may, and I think it is good to have a framework to foster this freedom of movement. And of course, even in the EAC, we do have it. However, if you think about it in the context of trade and services, the idea that I started off with to say we need to make linkages, what good would it be for me to have a right to come and reside in another country or to cross the border without having been required to, you know, to, to acquire a, a visa when then my, my goods cannot cross the border? So we, we have these you know, questions whereby you know, if you look at a given business in your own jurisdiction and you try to look into the requirements that would need to be met for them to cross the border. I mean, even if you give me a passport, even if there, there are no visas for me to, to apply for, I mean, as long as there are problems when it comes to the services that come along with my goods, if there are restrictions in terms of uh, transport and what have you, I mean, this is a zero sum game. There's nothing. And I always tell my, my negotiation students to say, there are very many ways in which you can negotiate a trade agreement and actually get out there having given people zero, nothing. And they would have thought that they got the market and actually there's no market whatsoever. And we see it with the many um, the preferential, sorry, the, the, you know, your, your, your everything but arms is and all these different preferential schemes that have been opened up to the LDC. So it's the same, the same, the same, the same issue. And lastly, I believe that we need to have the systems in place, the infrastructure. It is not just about putting in place um, um, you know, let's say you, you have a, a document that is signed by the heads of state. It's about the infrastructure security that uh, I think ladies uh, are touched on. How do you ensure that there's security, there's traceability? Our borders are porous and countries are nervous about it as well. So we need to be going into all those areas and making sure that we build confidence and we're able to make sure that we know if Macron goes into the Caribbean, maybe I'm somewhere in Barbados, you need to know where is this guy. <laughs> but thank you so much and, and I look forward to uh, engaging. These were some excellent, very, I think one of the audience members called it thought provoking. I, I think the two presentations were so complimentary because I think uh, Gladys went through sort of like the more traditional approach to, uh, and I, I suspect, as you mentioned, Macong, um, that although there may be differences in, in emphasis, I think all of these regional agreements from CARICOM to FCFTA to the REC, so the regional in, um, integration communities, uh, sort of follow the same sort of model, and I would be surprised if the FCFTA departs from it greatly. But I think that was complemented so much by your remarks, right? So I love the fact that you started with, does economic theory actually translate into the real world benefits on the ground to the MISMEs, the MSMSE, MSMEs, those that, that are actually participating? Um, and, and do we just follow, are we just in a sense following blindly models of integration and liberalization and welfare enhancement that have, we have inherited? So I think, you know, the, the traditional with the kind of the less traditional approach and forcing us to rethink it, you, you mentioned 60% of Africa's food comes from outside. In the case of the Caribbean, it's 80% of our food comes from outside. So as we negotiate these um, agreements and we focus a lot on models of integration and liberalization that are inherited, the question really, really becomes, you know, are we fostering? And I know, especially past COVID, that there was a lot more of an emphasis on re-indigenization of our food security and these things, and these are positive developments. The question now, as you're requiring us to do, is go back to the trade agreements, the legal text, um, and see whether that is bearing out what our ambitions are. And I know Kolo wants to jump in, but the, the other thing I wanted to mention, I think Nicole Foster picked up on that, is when you are inheriting all of these different trade frameworks that may be in conflict with each other at the domestic level, when some official or parliamentarian needs to implement it, which rules are you following? Uh, I thought that was an excellent point. And I think in the Caribbean, we may not have so many conflicts as much as um, the fact, because yes, with the, as, as much as the fact that the regional integration process um, and the ones that are requiring us to trade with third parties, there may be different paces 
of integration required, right, under the regional as opposed to what's happening under the EPA. Because in the Caribbean, we have very few international relations um, agreements so far. So the, the points are very similar, different in, uh, emphases, but I, I love that your two presentations, I thought they were so complimentary. Um, I, I want to go quickly to the Q&A, but Kolo, you please step in and, and you can give your feedback. I really wanted to make one point which you ultimately made, but I think, you know, with all of these conflicting rules that we've mentioned and, you know, sub-regions in the big region, what I learned um, in a you know, presentation at the SEAL conference yesterday is that there's a lot of need to reimagine what is happening on the ground and apply, as Geneva was saying, models that work for our regions, because it cannot be that we, you know, inherit these systems that do not work. You know, Africa's regional integration project has been going on for over 50 years, CARICON for a long time too, but things have not translated. And so how do we indigenize, as we like to say, all of these things that are coming and ha happening around us and make it true to what's happening on the ground? And this is something that I think the AFCFT at least has the opportunity to get right. And with the revisions of the CARICOM treaties, also to try and make things, you know, workable for the man and the woman on the streets. That was just my two cents. And uh, please, let's go on to. If there's any time for a question or two, I think the I think we would we I'll throw out the last question because we really have two minutes, and we would maybe go on beyond our time by five minutes, just so that the the speakers can reflect as, as they sum up. I think Patrick and Nam had the question, which I also had, um, and I want I would like. Um, Macomb to reflect on it is does the AFCFTA have a framework for developing African standards in the key IP issues like traditional knowledge or geographical indications? Does the framework really mirror the WTO regime? And I guess I would also ask you with respect to the other areas you mentioned, like services and goods, a more integrated transactional approach. To what extent is it a lost opportunity from what you're seeing already under the AFCFT? Because you mentioned these things, but I don't know to what extent, you know, you think we've lost an opportunity in what's going on in the AFCFTA. And I think I think I also time when Stuart wants to make the point that Afronomics is doing a lot of work in trying to produce papers that challenge hege hege hegemony of Western knowledge systems and trying to indigenize even the the, the papers and the policies and the thinking on these topics. So that's a contribution that we're seeing making. And then Gladys, as you sum up, I thought it would be really good to talk a little bit about what opportunities you see for business. Because every time I speak to business people in the region, they feel so divorced. They say, yes, you guys sound great. The lawyers sound great. You're talking about these things and integration process. But at the end of the day, and I think Macomb was, was talking about this. It's not translating to things that matter to them. Uh, how is it that we play a better role in, in bring, making them feel part of the process and making them, I know there's a Caribbean private sector organization, but I mean, more fundamentally, how are they involved in the rulemaking um, and also in the transparency efforts? Are they responding positively? So I'll stop there unless Kolo wants to add anything. No, and then I'll let Kolo sum up. So, so either Gladys or Macon, uh, feel free to summarize your your parting comments, and and then we'll close. Thank you. Okay, Macon, I will go first. Um, I would say, I mean, you know, disintegration through integration is going to just continue sticking through my mind, um, yes. partly, especially as we're moving forward, trying to do enhanced cooperation. Because Macon, we are coming from the wider group in and now moving towards trying to have maybe smaller groups move faster because the wider grouping is not moving fast enough. Um, and so we're going to have to definitely um, bear all of that in mind. I would say in relation to um, the SMEs, and, I, and I'd also want to say one more thing in terms of um, the fact that, as you, as you mentioned, Jan, about food security, and one of the biggest challenges that we're having in terms of movement of goods are the SPS measures that we have and, and, and the, the trade barriers. And those are some of the things that really and truly um, need to be addressed in relation to um, business and opportunities for business. Private sector would tell you it's there. I mean, like the CARICOM private sector organization 
is now an associate institution of CARICOM um, involved in the meetings, not just at the level of the conference, but also at the level of the councils and the smaller subcommittees. We have a memorandum of understanding and that organization is supposed to be consulting with the national groupings as well so that it's coming with a sort of regional position. When it comes to the when it comes to the opportunities though, and I mean, a, a big part of it is that sometimes our private sector, um, especially the smaller, um, smaller businesses are focused on, on the national sector session. They're not necessarily focused as broadly or not necessarily um, looking as widely as the rest of the single market. Um, and so, there are times where we have had to sort of bring them in, um, in terms of sessions. You have the Caribbean export that provides, provides some assistance to, to business as well. But in bringing them into sessions, in bringing them into like our, even our just, our small working group sessions when we're trying to work out a policy to see how it goes best. But really everybody needs to know that they also have the right at the national level to be involved in those discussions um, that are taking place at the national level and that are informing these regional positions. Without them, we're not going to get a proper decision making um, and, and proper positions in, in, in terms of how we go forward. Um, so that, that's what I would leave with and then we can expand on it in, in terms of in writing. Um, I think you said that you're going to try and put together that publication, so. Yes, indeed I will. Please go ahead, Macomb. Thank you very much, Jen. And uh, I, I took note of uh, uh, Patrick's uh, uh, question on, on trips. And uh, Patrick is a good friend of mine. So I, I, when you mentioned his name, I, I, I know that he will cause trouble for me. Um, but uh, the, 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 the beauty about trips agreement is that it sets minimum standards, as we know. So um, there are endless opportunities as to what the AFCFTA can do in that particular, particular space. Be that as it may, there are also challenges. Let me give an example. You have uh, some countries, for example, some of the North African countries have um, FTAs with the United States. And one, some of those FTAs already, they really put very high levels of uh, IP protection. And the question is, which is something that the African governments have to think through clearly, how are they going to uh, reconcile the flexibilities of LDCs on one side, the agreements that an, an FTA is on IP that, or rather that touch on IP that African countries have with third countries, you will have to reconcile all, those, the, the, all of those. The, the, the third leg of this conversation is that you also have a challenge of developing countries and LDCs. So if you therefore want to have a common regime, uh, you know, common standards, across the continent, how are you going to do that? And these are the, some of the things that we need to think about as the continent. The, by the way, there could be opportunities where you're having a dual system where others apply higher levels, levels of standards, others apply lower level, level of standards. And at the back of this, let's remember that in Africa, we have industrialization plans. And in some region, we even have priority sectors. We also have plans to you know, enhance value chains. So there could be, if you look at it from a business point of view, it all depends on how it plays out and how governments are willing to be creative in terms of making use of this opportunity. Have we lost this opportunity in terms of uh, making sure that we have linkages between trading goods and trading services? I think not. I think we, we have to appreciate the, 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 the possible advantages that we can seize out there. Just to go back on the point that I just mentioned about the how, how do we contextualize our trade agreements um, into the regional value chain strategies that we are having, the export strategies that we are having. Not only that, how do we, cons do, do we reconcile and merge the trade policies and industrial policies? So it is possible because the moment you tell me that a given country or a region, they have an interest to industrialize and the target sector is pharmaceutical products. Just imagine the universe of things that we can do in the area of uh, pharmaceuticals and different countries contributing to that and therefore being able to open up markets, whether it be goods and services, simply attached to this, this, uh, this area of pharmaceuticals. So I think there's a, you know, it's about creativity and innovation. And I think there are things that can be done and everybody else will go out of the room being a winner. 
the last uh, part that has been raised about uh, the indigenization and moving away from the traditional approaches. I, I, I am not an advocate of moving away from the traditional approaches, and I'll say why. In the first instance, I think we need to make sure that we, 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 we take whatever dividends that are coming out of the small and medium enterprise market that we have in our countries. I think we need to catch in on that. And we are seeing many things that are happening in Africa. I will give you an example. Today we are told, for example, if you look at um, the, the, the audio visual uh, industry, let's say we are having now the American big recording companies coming down to Africa to sign the African uh, musicians and then they are under their label. And that tells you something. We, we are having also, you know, Netflix and others coming down to the continent. We are seeing an African content going on Netflix. The thing is, in the process, I cannot say Netflix go out of Africa. We don't want you here. Netflix, yes, maybe they may actually create a bit of a challenge in terms of competition, but they're also bringing in the technologies here in Africa. So we need technologies, transfer of technologies from these big multinational companies. And we need to find a way because we can't, you know, just, you know, blindly go away from this. And at the same time, we are saying we want investments to come into Africa. You don't have that money. How are you going to get that money? Somebody who's going to invest in Africa would need a return on their investment. So you need to make sure that you balance the need to have other foreign companies come into Africa, invest in Africa, create employment in Africa. They will make their own profits, but at the same time, make sure that you re the, um, the the needs and as well as the interests of the small and medium enterprises. So I would be an advocate of a balanced system, let's say a, an ambidextrous system that is able to work both ways, but it has to be managed very well. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. And thanks to you and Gladys for what was another excellent, spirited, dynamic, thought-provoking webinar series, uh, webinar uh, episode from our series. Um, I think it just is left for me to close. Um, let me first start by thanking the audience who, you know, you can always gauge audience interest because even when you go beyond the one hour, there's still uh, very, very little attrition. So obviously this is a topic that has uh, kept people interested. As I mentioned in the last webinar, what we're trying to do is to take the written um, presentations or written forms of the presentations uh, that our speakers have made and compile it into some kind of publication that will then be uh, better able to be kept for posterity. But we habitually um, make our recordings available. So on our SRC website or on our LinkedIn, uh, you'll be able to also uh, see the recordings as soon as they are, are available. So uh, on behalf of, let me just quickly advertise the next session which we will have, um, and I'm gonna just share the screen um, as I have in previous webinars. Our next speakers on the 13th of July will deal with this topic of investment regimes, which I think was already sort of uh, shadowed in this discussion. And for that, we have Dr. Chantal Ononewu from CARICOM, and we have Professor Makan Mbenge from the University of Geneva. And they will be speaking about different approaches to investment. So joining, you know, sharing your networks on behalf of my co-facilitator, Kolo Kruger and myself, let me thank you all and thank our wonderful speakers for another excellent, excellent webinar. Thank you all and see you all next week. Bye-bye.